now let's move on and let's talk about payoff matrices. So here we have a simple payoff matrix with two players, and each of these players has two options, A and B. Now player two's choice determines which column of this payoff matrix they end up in. Now player one, based on their choice, determines which row we end up in. So if player two chooses strategy B, indicating the second column, and player one chooses strategy A, indicating the first row, then we end up in this upper right box here, okay? and so on. And then in each box, we can write the payoffs for each player. Okay? So maybe, well, the convention is to show the payoffs to player two in the upper right-hand portion of the box, and the payoffs to player one in this lower left-hand part of the box, right? So, we, you know, whichever player, whichever sort of person is sort of in the left who determines the, the row that we end up in, their payoff is in this lower corner. And the other player who determines the column, their payoffs are in this upper right-hand corner. Now, actually, their payoffs are going to be represented by numbers where higher is better. And so let's fill this out for a particular game here. Okay, so for example, if player two chooses B and player one chooses A, then player one gets a payoff of six and player two gets a payoff of two. Oops, there's one mistake here. So let's look at this. We're going to look for a Nash equilibrium. A Nash equilibrium is a set of strategies, one strategy for player two and one strategy for player one, where neither player would want to unilaterally, that means on their own, be the only one to change their strategy. The way you see if something's a Nash equilibrium is it usually looks box by box or sort of each possible outcome. If they're in this box here, it indicates that each player, players one and two, are both choosing strategy B. So let's see if either player would want to unilaterally deviate from that strategy. Suppose player two were to deviate and instead of choosing strategy B, were instead to choose strategy A. Then their payoff would change from three to six. And since we assume higher is better, that would indicate a higher payoff. So this box here cannot possibly be a Nash equilibrium, right? Because at least one of the players would want to deviate and change their strategy. Okay? The only way it's a Nash equilibrium is if none of the players in the game would like to unilaterally change their strategy, assuming that the other player's strategy is fixed and does not change. Okay. So we see that this box is not a Nash equilibrium. Let's look at this box here. Now we can see that player two would not want to change their strategy. If they were to change their strategy, their payoffs would go from six to three. Let's look at player one. Player one, remember, gets to choose the row. If they were to change their strategy from B to A, then their payoff would actually increase from two to four. So player one would want to unilaterally change their strategy. So this box can also not be a Nash equilibrium. Okay, so we've ruled out these two boxes. If you, kind of, if you look at this box here, you could see that player B would want to change their strategy, so this is not a Nash equilibrium. If you look here, you could actually see that this upper box, where this, or the strategies of each player being A, so the Nash equilibrium is player 2A, player 1A, that is, in fact, a Nash equilibrium. Okay, so let's verify that. If they're both choosing uh, strategy A and player two were to deviate, their payoff would change from four to two. And if player one were to change their strategy from A to B, their payoff would decline from four to two as well. So both players, they're the only one to act, would actually lower their payoffs if they change their strategy. Hence, this is a Nash equilibrium. Let's consider the prisoner's dilemma game. So let's actually use the 
typical example, a police um, and catches two criminals, but they don't have much evidence on them. If they can't get either to confess, then they can only send them to jail for two years because of lack of evidence. However, if they get one of them to implicate the other, the implicated person will end up getting 10 years in jail because that will provide enough evidence to convict them for a more serious crime. And the police officers are offering each player uh, to reduce their sentence to one year if they're the one that rats out the other. But if both of them rat out each other, both of them implicate each other, then each will get eight years in jail. Okay? So let's look at this game. The payoffs are written as negative numbers. Because you want to have the least large negative number, the least time in jail. And here you can see if they both confess, each of them gets eight years in jail, indicating a payoff of minus eight for each of them. Okay? If player two maintains his innocence, but player one confesses, then the one who maintains his innocence, player two, gets 10 years in jail, or payoff of minus 10. And the person who confessed, player one, gets a payoff of minus one, indicating one year in jail. Okay, and so on and so on. Now, if you look at this game, and this was intentionally designed this way, and in fact, that's how police designed the game, each player has a dominant strategy. No matter what the other player does, a given player's best strategy is to implicate the other or rat out the other player. Okay, so let's look at this. Let's say uh, that player two maintains their innocence. Okay, you can see the two possible payoffs for player one, confess or maintain innocence. If player one confesses, when player two uh, maintains their innocence, then player one's payoffs is higher, it's a smaller negative number, um, if they confess, right? They'd rather spend one year in jail than two years in jail. If player two confesses, then player one has two possible strategies, confess or maintain innocence. If they maintain the innocence, they get 10 years in jail, whereas if they confess, they get eight years in jail, okay? So again, it's better to confess. So whether player two confesses or maintains their innocence, player one gets less time in jail if they confess. And you could go through this and verify yourself, the same holds for player two. No matter whether player one confesses or maintains their innocence, player two is better off confessing. And that means that the only Nash equilibrium in this game, the only set of Nash equilibrium strategies is for each player to confess. So if you sort of look at the payoffs, the sum of the payoffs in each of these boxes, you see that jointly they get the worst payoff in the Nash equilibrium. That is the total jail time is the most in this Nash equilibrium here. So that's the basic idea of the prisoner's dilemma game. The dominant strategy actually results in the worst overall outcome. So let's look at one other uh, payoff matrix here. So I want you to spend a few moments looking at this payoff matrix and figuring out what the Nash equilibrium or equilibria are. Okay, so pause the video. When you're done trying to come up with your answer, unpause it and we'll move on. Okay, you're back. Uh, so let's go over the answer. So some of you might have said player two chooses B and player one chooses A, and you're right. That's a Nash equilibrium. But if you said that player two chooses A and player one chooses B, you'd also be right. That's a Nash equilibrium. And likewise, C and C are a Nash equilibrium. So why am I showing you this? The answer is that Nash equilibria are not necessarily unique. Now this is actually very important for advanced economics work that you might do in grad school if you were ever to go on and get a PhD. And the point is that there's multiple possible Nash equilibria, and we don't know which of those would actually result. Okay, so let's think about the prisoner's dilemma game and how it relates to collusion. The basic idea here is that collusion, or sort of the game of trying to collude, is a prisoner's dilemma game. If two firms, two oligopoly firms, were to collude, they would both earn higher profits than they would under sort of normal oligopoly equilibrium strategies. But each firm has a dominant strategy, and that is to cheat on the collusive agreement. 
And so they end up with the lowest overall payoff, the worst overall payoff, if they follow their dominant strategy to cheat. Okay, so you, know, you can see this in this particular example in this payoff matrix here. You can see if they both cheat, they get a payoff of four. If they both collude, they get a payoff of 10. If one cheats and the other colludes, the cheating firm gets a payoff of 15, whereas the other firm gets a payoff of two, and so on. Okay, we're gonna come back to this example in a second. So firms would like to earn monopoly profits, they'd like to earn higher profits, but the dominant strategy is to cheat on the collusive agreement, which would sort of prevent them from doing that. 